So welcome everyone. Really glad you're able to join us here today for today's session. I have the honor of chairing it and I get to introduce our presenters for today. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to start with Dr. Sabina Singh. She's the Director of Research for Campbell South Asia. And Sabina is a trained social anthropologist with a doctorate from the Center of Social Medicine and Community Health at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And she is interested in research related to gender, poverty, and migration, inequalities in well being, and qualitative research methods. At Campbell, she is leading projects related to marginalized populations, such as the homeless and in high income countries, women in agriculture and low and middle income countries, and the empowerment of women and girls in developing countries. She's going to start us off with a presentation on the evidence gap as uh, um, results. And then uh, joining her will be Lovely Tolan, who's a consultant at the Campbell Collaboration. Uh, Lovely is a consultant who holds a master's degree in public policy from the National University of Singapore. She previously worked at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies as a research specialist, and her interests include poverty, agricultural economics, and regional economic development. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Martin Prouse, who is the evaluation specialist in the Independent Evaluation Unit at the Green Climate Fund, who's going to finish off with a presentation on why uh, the evidence gap map was um, commissioned and its purpose going forward. So he is applying 15 years of work experience in international development to support the IEU's work streams on impact evaluation, evidence reviews, and behavioral science. He holds a PhD from the University of Manchester and is an editor of the European Journal of Development Research. So um, we're going to launch into the presentations very shortly. I'd like to invite all the participants as the presentations are going, please feel free to add your comments or questions in the chat box. At the end of the presentations, we're going to have a Q&A discussion and we can use the questions that you've entered, as well as you'll have an opportunity to speak yourself, raise your hand, et cetera, at the end. Okay, I think that's everything. Can I turn it over to you, Sabina? Thank you, Edson, for the introduction as well as uh, chairing this session. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening as per your time zones. Uh, so, the, today I'm going to talk about this evidence and gap map of evaluations of interventions to increase women's empowerment. And I'll be joined by Lovely Tolin. Uh, she will be presenting some of the sections of the presentation as well. So, first of all, I must acknowledge the support that we have got from the Independent Evaluation Unit, Green Climate Fund, and International Fund for Agricultural Development. They have funded this evidence and gap map, as well as the following, uh, you know, the systematic review that fall from this uh, evidence and gap map. And uh, the other team members, uh, in addition to me, are Howard White, Naila Kabir, Lovely Tolin, Sabrina Dise, Hikari Umazeva. Uh, Rati Bhai Vijayama, Neha Gupta, Carolyn Oteke, Martha Katerika, uh, Hugh Sharma Waddington, Rissel Kachos, uh, Rohit, Rohit Shah. We, we are mostly from Campbell except for Naila Kabir. Uh, then the team from IEU GCF IFAD includes Martin Pros, who's there with us today, Asha Varsame, Andreas Ruman, Jyotsna Puri, Vibhuti Mandirata, uh, Deborah Sunke. Mir Shariar, Islam, Romina Gavatasi, Ndaya Balchika, As, uh, and Aslian Arslan. Uh, our adv advisory team members included uh, Marcus Goldstein, uh, Sabil Wongal Negwis, uh, Shagun Sabrawal, and Tabitha Mulambiji. And we've used uh, API reviewer uh, for uh, this evidence and gap map like for the data management. So the API support team member Anastasia Koryakina's support is also uh, kindly acknowledged. Uh, so I'll broadly give you an overview of the presentation that what is uh, it that we're going to cover today. So first I'll talk very briefly about the evidence and gap map and its utilities just for someone who is uninitiated and might not be knowing what an EGM is or evidence and gap map is. So I'll talk briefly about that. Uh, then I'll talk about the gender map. Actually, every evidence and gap map that we have, we usually have a short name for that map, the nickname. So this map is called the gender map. 
So I'll talk about the PCOS and then the coding framework and then various stages like uh, what are there uh, in an EGM, like how do we do that, some findings of that EGM. And then how we reach on to a particular systematic review from um, evidence and gap map, give, giving you an example of this particular evidence and gap map, how we uh, arrived at the systematic review. Then what are the peaks of that systematic reviews? And finally, Lovely will be sharing with us some of the meta-analysis challenges. Actually, uh, we are at a stage uh, uh, where we have extracted most of the data for the systematic reviews, and we are almost uh, we are doing meta-analysis as well. So Lovely will be sharing about some of those meta-analysis challenges. Uh, so, first of all, what is an evidence and gap? So, it's a, a visual depiction of evidence on a particular research area or a research topic. And it is generally along a matrix, which uh, in most effectiveness maps is along interventions and outcome, uh, usually along the rows and the columns. So, uh, it, so the, the, your indicators might vary as per your research question for this matrix, because let's say if you are doing uh, a process evaluation map in that case, uh, and if you're particularly interested in knowing the barriers and facilitators that are there for a particular intervention, then you might have the interventions as uh, the roles and your barriers and facilitators in the columns. So, th so those things keep on changing, like so that it is quite flexible that way you can, you know, uh, uh, mend it as per your research questions, or you know, uh, you can also decide what kind of evidence you want to include are relevant to your research questions. Uh, and then stakeholder engagement is uh, an important part of this uh, exercise because uh, you might would like to involve people who are experts in the field uh, on a particular topic. And then uh, depending on you know, their knowledge and from their feedback and contribution, you can you know, chart out the framework for the maps. And stakeholder engagement is a very crucial process uh, in evidence and gap maps because you need to chart out the intervention categories, the subcategories, and the outcome categories and subcategories. So the usually the metrics that I was talking of, so those rows and columns, they are called generally the primary dimensions of the map, uh, which an effectiveness map would generally be interventions and outcomes. So they are the primary dimensions. In addition to those primary dimensions, there can be certain filters. So you might have filters related to the target group of the interventions. They could be where this, where this uh, particular intervention was delivered, whether it was a rural area or an urban area or things like that. So you can have filters as per your requirement. And it is interactive that you can select certain filters and uh, you know uh, scroll through the studies that are there in the map. And there can be different uh, ways in which the map can be visualized depending upon the kind of software you're using or the app you're using to generate a particular map. It could be in the form of uh, bubbles, could be donuts, and uh, uh, so these are the visual features of that. And by interactive, I mean that once you see, uh, you know, a bubble in a particular cell, you can click on that and you get to see the bibliographic details of that map. And if the funders have commissioned the summaries, you might also see a, a short summary of that particular uh, study. Uh, and this is important to note that just like systematic reviews, uh, the stages in the evidence and gap maps, they are quite systematic that we do systematic searching, we do systematic screening, coding, this is done by two people, reconciliations are done, and uh, the data extraction is done and critical appraisal is done. So the steps are quite similar to the systematic reviews, just that this uh, evidence and gap map is quite broader in scope uh, compared to systematic review and the analysis is limited. Like you can have basic, you know, frequencies analysis of uh, where the intervention was delivered and the examples of filters that I told you. But uh, uh, the uh, the effects of a particular intervention, all those things, that kind of analysis you would find in the systematic review. And one thing that is important or sort of, you know, useful for these maps is that they can be updated annually or uh, you know, whenever you have, you know, uh, resources to update them. And also there are some examples of live or living maps, like they are being updated in the real time. So there is a paper by Ashita Cern and Howard White. So where they have uh, compared different approaches of the evidence and gap maps. So you can refer to this paper for more information. I will probably put that uh, towards the end of my presentation in the chat box, the link of the paper. 
So coming to this uh, gender map or this map of evaluations of interventions for women's empowerment. So the population for this particular map was girls and women of any age in low and middle income countries or developing countries, uh, especially the non-annexure one countries as you find by the word of all. And the target group could be uh, also uh, men as well as uh, boys of any age. So we didn't restrict by gender or age. The aim was to, you know, get to uh, the, to get the studies that are uh, sort of, you know, uh, that are targeting women. And also for the uh, sort of, you know, like uh, the interventions that I talk of that, as I mentioned, they are intended to increase women's empowerment. But sometimes it could be the case that the study doesn't uh, directly mentions that it is targeting, uh, you know, uh, it is it is for women's empowerment or it could be the otherwise case. So just to make sure that we don't lose many studies, we actually uh, thought that we, we would rather be focusing on the outcomes so that we don't miss on any studies. So uh, some of the intervention categories for this map included uh, the policy and uh, institutional interventions, the capacity building interventions, then uh, various other subcategories, economic interventions and gender awareness activities for social behavioral change interventions. Then uh, since it, uh, for the effectiveness studies, the comparison of control groups could be there, which could be receiving different interventions uh, or the very same interventions uh, with different intensity or they may be on weight list with controls. So outcomes, uh, as per our framework, we had uh, zeroed on to self-empowerment, social, political, and economic empowerment. And of course, both the interventions and outcomes, they have further subcategories. The study designs for this evidence and gap maps, uh, evidence and gap map were impact evaluations, process evaluations, and systematic reviews. And it is important to note that we use little uh, broader definition of impact evaluations that we don't or uh, uh, solely focus on the randomized control trials, but we also include uh, other quasi-experimental designs and uh, even before and after designs with the control group. So the control group is, a, is something that has to be there. So this is just a, a sort of, you know, uh, how we start with the developing a framework for, you know, once you have to identify these interventions and outcomes, like they are not coming from air anywhere. So you, you read the literature and then you uh, also discuss with the subject specialist and then you sort of, you know, basically put all your PCOS kind of, you know, things on a paper, you know, maybe it could be a, a, a thing like uh, do it, you can do it with pen or paper like we've done or you can, you know, also do it on a computer or a Word document. And this is the refined version. So you see this is very crude, very rough version. And this is how we you know, reached at the various intervention categories and the subcategories. And uh, also uh, you see on the right-hand side that there are these definitions that we have. So this is a code book, how a code book or, uh, looks like. So you have intervention categories, the very first column, then you have sub-intervention categories, and then you have definitions. So these definitions make sure that the coders are on the track, that they are on the same page, uh, their understanding of the sub-intervention categories is, you know, as close to each other as possible. But then there can always be little uh, discrepancies which are usually resolved during reconciliations. So as I told you, these are the five broad categories of interventions and their sub-intervention categories. For example, let's say take this one, support civil society and community organizations. So we had national organizations, self-help groups, farmers groups, savings groups, cooperatives, and other community groups. I'm just giving you one example. So similar is the case with the outcomes. So we had the self, social, economic, and political empowerment. And uh, uh, further down, there are these uh, subcategories. And here are the descriptions of you know, these uh, subcategories of outcomes. So I must mention here that we reached at this framework with, uh, and we coded a uh, couple of studies over a period of two, three months with the uh, funders, with uh, team members from IFAD and uh, GCF. And then we kind of, you know, this is how we reached at this stage. So from pilot coding to, you know, those benchmark studies, we kind of refined. And as Howard uh, usually says that revise, refine, and divine, define. So this, these definitions are, you know, uh, not uh, reached on, on day one, but it takes a long period of time to reach them or to come up with these kind of definitions. So, uh, 
we did the pilot coding. And then, as I mentioned earlier, so an EGM has almost similar stages uh, like that of a systematic review, except for the analysis part. Uh, but the analysis is of different kind in an EGM. So we did uh, searches for databases, for studies, real literature, website searches, hand searches of journals, and citation tracking. Then the screening of uh, title and abstracts was done. <clears throat> uh, then the screening at full text stage was done. Data extraction and reconciliations were done. And finally, uh, we generated a map uh, using the API mapper. So as regards the search methods, we had quite a comprehensive search for this and we confined to English language studies. We didn't confine them to a particular or specific period. So the period was open, but we started, uh, we searched eight academic databases. They were cab abstracts, econlit with full text, political science complete, JSTOR, ProQuest, PubMed, Say journals, uh, and Scopus and Web of Science. Then for the website of real literature searches, we searched and gender impact, happy systematic reviews, happy knowledge library, ideas repack, International Center for Research on Women, National Bureau for Economic Research, Social Science Research Unit, UN Women and USAID. Then we had a list of about 15 journals, uh, uh, which were like gender technology and development, gender and development, journal development effectiveness, the name of some of the journals. So we shared this list with our advisory group members and they kind of approved that, yes, we can find you know uh, relevant articles from these journals. And uh, the issues of uh, like the five, uh, the five years, the last five years issues of the journals were hand searched, <laughs> right? Rather screened because we can now, you know, we didn't really go into the libraries, but screen them on the, on our computer screens for last five years. And then the citation tracking of included studies, we mostly did the backward citation tracking, that is the citations that are cited in the papers or, you know, that are given in the references of papers or the included studies. <laughs> so this is the prisma flow chart so this shows uh, like these two blocks they show the flow of studies from databases and these are the uh, set of studies from other sources including website searches hand searches and citation tracking so in all, we identified 5,010 studies. They were after, uh, you know, merging and deduplicating, and further 20 duplicates were removed from them. Thereafter, we reached at 4,990 records, and about 4,255 were excluded, and we were left with 735, of which we couldn't find full text for 25 reports. Finally, we assessed 710 records for full text. <coughs> And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> 456 records were excluded at this stage. We were left with 254 records or reports. These are from the databases. And similarly, this is the flow of records that we got from the other sources. So these were 187 in total 441. <coughs> and then there can be instances when, you know, there are multiple uh, papers from the same study. So we take the most uh, complete and the latest version. So we do link those records and that led to 423 records, out of which uh, 288 were impact evaluations, 105 were process evaluations and 38 were systematic reviews. <coughs> So this is a snapshot of the averages and gap map. And for those who uh, are not very, are not much familiar with the averages and gap map, this is how it looks like. So the text is a little tiny, somewhat tiny. So I will probably help you read that. So this is capacity building, life skills training, technical and vocational training, business training and mentoring, and in uh, and ICT intervention, information communication technology intervention. And these are the outcomes: so self empowerment social empowerment, economic empowerment, and the like. So here, the bigger the bubble means that you have more, more uh, evidence there, more number of studies there. And they can be color coded as per, you know, your desired scheme, color scheme. For example, we coded green for the impact evaluations, <coughs> red for the uh, systematic reviews, and blue is for 
process evaluation. <clears throat> so, for example, if you see this blog, this cell X is to justice, and uh, this is for life skills training. So, you really have really less evidence there, and there are only few systematic reviews there. <coughs> Now briefly talk about an a broad overview of this EGM. So in terms of like where the evidence comes from, what are the countries or regions from where you know we have this evidence on interventions for women empowerment. So as you see, the lower middle income is the highest bar here. So we had 280 uh, studies for this uh, for lower and middle income countries. 119 for low income countries. Upper middle had. Uh, 99 uh, studies, high income three, and then there can be instances when they have, they aren't actually mentioning the where the study was conducted. So this also happens sometimes. So you code that as not reported. So as regards uh, the region-wise distribution, like geographic region-wise distribution, we see most of the evidence is from Sub-Saharan Africa with 186 studies. South Asia uh, with 171 studies, then uh, Latin America 60, and there were some stu uh, some studies from Europe and Central Asia as well, as we took that Kyoto Protocol uh, country classification. <coughs> we talk about the country-wise distribution, we see that uh, though region-wise, if you see Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest number of, uh, number of studies, but country-wise, India has the highest number of studies, followed by Bangladesh. And uh, these are like kind of top 20 countries in, the, in terms of number of studies. But uh, please note that uh, this there can be instances, like let's say for systematic reviews there, uh, there can be studies in that from India, Bangladesh, and maybe Nepal or Mexico. So in that case, you know, the numbers won't be adding up. <laughs> So here um, I'm showing this uh, distribution of evidence across region and intervention categories. So you see that across all the regions, the economic interventions, they are uh, in highest number. So for any of the regions, so that, so that gives you a broader trend of, you know, where the evidence is mostly concentrated. It is mostly around economic interventions. And then, uh, if you see the capacity building one, so again, uh, uh, we have you know good number of studies and the gender awareness activities, they are also in good number. So policy and institutional actually figure out very few in number compared to the other set of interventions. <clears throat> so this is by the income region. So same trend that economic interventions are, you know, uh, highest in number followed by the capacity building. But here we also have support to civil society and community organization for low middle income countries, uh, the same number as the uh, capacity building interventions. But overall, we see that the economic interventions are very high in um, uh, the, like the evidence is mostly concentrated around economic interventions. <clears throat> I showed you uh, the previous slide just in uh, as regards the country, but here it is uh, as per the interventions. So you see that uh, for India, the highest number of interventions, uh, highest number of studies are in for the support to civil society and community organization interventions. So this could be the case that uh, because there have been many studies around self-help groups, so that could be one possible. That is the one possibility that this uh, is the highest bar here. But uh, otherwise. For economic interventions, usually the bar is uh, higher for, uh, like when we compare it across various interventions for various countries. <clears throat> so this uh, sort of, you know, this slide uh, shows us the interventions by study design. So here, this is the overall impact evaluations. This is the process evaluations. And these are the breakdown of, you know, uh, impact evaluations in randomized control trials, non-experimental design, design with comparison group and before after design with control groups. So here also we see that the economic interventions are usually the, higher, the highest ones across, you know, various, um, uh, even within the study designs.
followed by the capacity building interventions, then the gender awareness activities, then the support to civil society, and finally the for policy and institutional ones, you know, they are, the, uh, they are less in number. So now I'm just talking in terms of various filters. So we have a couple of uh, study, uh, we have a couple of filters here. So one of the filters for uh, the EGM was target group of interventions. So we had classified them young women, women 25 and above, men and boys, girls. So there can be instances that an intervention is targeted at both young, uh, uh, young women and young men. So it would, you know, the study would figure out in both the bars. And then uh, community leaders, NGO workers, or government officials. <clears throat> then the population subgroups we had identified were poor and, dis poor and disadvantaged, the humanitarian setting, conflict related, and people with disabilities. And then they can, there were instances where you know the subgroup uh, classification wasn't clear. So the highest number of studies were targeted at poor, you know, uh, men and women, or boys or girls. And people with disabilities figured out, I mean, we figured out that there were very few number of studies for people with disabilities. <laughs> so this is uh, just a distribution of uh, studies by st uh, study design. As I mentioned earlier, we have 288 impact evaluations. We had 105 process evaluations and 38 systematic reviews. And this is for the sub distribution uh, of, you know, impact evaluations, RCTs, 143, non-experimental design with comparison group 131 and before versus after design, there were 19. So uh, as regards the location of the intervention, uh, most of the studies in this EGM we found were uh, from the rural areas or semi-rural areas. And uh, there were instances in both rural and urban for the sites of intervention. So, uh, and then urban, very urban. And there were instances when they hadn't clearly mentioned whether it was a rural or an urban setting. As regards the implementer, we had studies where government agency and local NGO, they both, you know, uh, tied up together and implemented an intervention, but then there were instances where a government agency implemented it itself. Then in addition to that, some uh, interventions were implemented by the private sector or the official development agencies. Uh, as for the setting of the intervention, we had uh, uh, more studies uh, conducted in the community settings. And then uh, 51 studies were conducted in schools and colleges. Uh, some were conducted in training centers as well, and 28 were conducted in private sector organizations. So as I've been, I will be talking about this continuously because that is the trend we have found in this um, particular EGM that economic interventions is the has got the highest number of studies followed by the capacity building. And then here we have support to civil society community organization followed by gender awareness activities and policy institutions. They figure, I mean, they are the uh, lowest in number. So if we talk about the outcomes, self and social empowerment were frequently observed uh, in addition to economic empowerment and then political empowerment. So this process evaluation uh, block figures here because uh, we also coded those process evaluations, but because of the constraints in the software, we had to put this category somewhere. So we had just put it here uh, for uh, our reference. This is the aggregate map. If you see, uh, so you see again, uh, the same trend that I've been talking, economic interventions, they were found uh, in the highest number. <laughs> And uh, we did assess the confidence in findings of systematic reviews, but not for the impact evaluation uh, or process evaluations. So we found that uh, 30 studies were of low confidence, three were of moderate confidence, and five were high confidence. So these, uh, this assessment is done using AMSTAR checklist. Uh, so there are certain questions regarding whether the PICOs were defined, whether the protocol was there, whether the search was done uh, comprehensively, uh, so there are a set of 16 questions, and based on that AMSTAR checklist, we actually can place how much confidence, we can actually state how much confidence can be placed in any of the systematic reviews. 
So these are some of the observations from the EGM, like uh, the most saturated area in the map is that of economic interventions. And we have existing systematic reviews with economic interventions such as cash transfers, microfinance, self-help groups. And then there are relatively less studies on interventions facilitating access to markets. Structural interventions also have good number of studies in this EGM, and they are about changing gender norms or maybe addressing uh, interpersonal violence. Or, and they usually involve interventions such as community conversations, role play theater, et cetera, to sensitize communities. Then the capacity building interventions are also there in good number, but they are mostly coupled with some economic or structural interventions. And there were relatively less systematic reviews in this area. So this is just a summary of, you know, a, a very brief summary of this EGM. So, uh, so after we were done with this, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, this EGM, the next step was to figure out the potential area of systematic reviews. So we could have identified any of these areas. What we generally see is that there should be sufficient number of studies to conduct a systematic review. And then it should not be uh, so full of systematic reviews that it is already a saturated area. So we have to look for, an, for some areas which you know, have potential uh, of uh, being you know, where we can conduct systematic reviews. So these are some of the ideas that we had discussed during our meeting with the GCF and uh, IFA team. Uh, financial literacy interventions, which were part of uh, capacity building. Then again, something uh, that was around capacity building and gender awareness activities, economic interventions and business skill training, like combination of these kind of interventions, digital finance interventions. And finally, uh, we zeroed on to the life skills education training, which falls under the capacity building interventions. And life skills, uh, so this is the title of the systematic review that we zeroed into. So this was effectiveness of life skills, education or training interventions for the empowerment of women in developing countries. So life skills are defined as the abilities for adaptive and positive behavior that enables individuals to deal effectively with the demands and challenges of everyday life. So how our review is different from existing reviews. So one of the things is that most of the reviews that are there on life skills interventions, they are usually confined by a particular age group. So we don't have that restriction of any age group. We also haven't put any restriction of any population subgroup, such as people with disabilities or people from you know, disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, similarly, some uh, systematic reviews, they are confined to specific settings such as schools. And then some uh, reviews could be there where they are interested in uh, mental health outcomes or some other outcomes, but not really the empowerment. So to our knowledge, we don't know of any systematic review that talks of life skills interventions uh, for uh, you know, women empowerment. So that is how it is different from the existing reviews. So the population is same as the EGM, like uh, we are not uh, restricted by uh, restricting the population by age or gender or uh, subgroups. The intervention is life, uh, life skills education or life skills training. Uh, they have to have a comparison or control group. So that means we are taking the same broad, uh, uh, you know, uh, this classification of impact evaluation. Then outcomes could be the same that we had in uh, the EGM itself and social empowerment as primary outcomes, economic and political outcomes as the secondary outcomes. And the intermediate outcomes are learning outcomes or communication and communication of soft skills. So basically, uh, when people engage in a life skill intervention, it leads to uh, you know some gain in knowledge. They learn something new, and then that leads to a kind of you know was a feeling of self confidence or self worth, self esteem. Uh, like, uh, and then they can uh, sort of you know take some initiatives to make uh, groups or uh, you know organize themselves in groups, and they might even raise. Uh, uh, you know, voice about certain injustices. They can organize themselves across uh, for certain rights. They might get aware about their rights. And uh, accordingly, uh, so this is like, I'm just telling about how life skills intervention lead to these kind of outcomes. So, could, so self and social are quite linear. But if we talk of the economic and political environment, the kind of skills that they acquire, they might also be uh, sort of, you know, uh, getting them empowered at the economic and political level. And for our purpose, we have uh, self and social as primary outcomes, economic and political as secondary outcomes. And as I mentioned, the learning and uh, soft skills, communication skills, all those are intermediate outcomes. 
coming back, taking you back to the same slide that I showed initially. So these are the same categories that we are uh, sort of, you know, confining ourselves to. These are the first two uh, uh, blocks are the primary uh, outcomes and the last two blocks are the secondary outcomes. So now over to Lovely. And as I mentioned earlier, we are almost uh, done with the preliminary meta-analysis. So she will be sharing some of the challenges with meta-analysis. Thank you and over to Lovely. Uh, thanks a lot, Sabina. So I'll proceed to uh, presenting uh, some of the key challenges that our team has encountered in terms of conducting the meta-analysis. So one is in terms of the outcome categorization or selection. The second one is in terms of the lack of common indices uh, across the included studies for the systematic review. And the third one is selecting um, which results to include in the meta-analysis, particularly among uh, those studies which support um, results under multiple model specifications. So in terms of the outcomes, um, one of the challenges that we've encountered was in terms of classifying outcomes, ambiguous outcomes in specific uh, outcome or sub outcome category. So say, for example, entrepreneurship score, uh, one could either think that it could be under uh, classified under self uh, leadership outcome or probably under communication skills. Or say, for example, an outcome which is on wage earnings, one could either probably classify it as an employment outcome or an income outcome. So in cases like this, wherein there are ambiguous outcomes, which are probably um, there is like in a conflict in terms of like categorizing those, uh, we discuss it internally within the team on which, which categorization this, these types of outcomes um, best fall under. Um, there are also some outcomes which are um, quite um, prevail prevalent in um, the studies that were uh, included in the systematic review. An example of these are like child outcomes. But then we ended up um, excluding these types of outcomes as we find these as not relevant to the research um, question or rather the topic of the systematic review. So the second uh, issue we had is in terms of like lack, lack of common indices. So in a lot of the studies that were included in the systematic, uh, for the systematic review, a lot of them um, actually report outcomes in terms of indices. And these outcomes were included, uh, uh, were included in the meta-analysis. Um, and we exclude the subcomponents of these indices. But the issue here is that um, uh, the common indices are not, uh, the indices are quite heterogeneous across the studies and they're not common. Other uh, cases wherein they might be named uh, the same, say for example, life skills index, but the subcomponents in terms of computing these indices are still quite different. Then the last um, issue or rather challenge that we had was um, in terms of um, um, selecting which specific result we'd like to include in the meta-analysis. Um, a lot of the studies actually um, report um, results under multiple model specifications. And in this regard, what we ended up including in for the meta-analysis uh, were the results from the models which have the lowest risk of bias selected, or in other words, those uh, the mod, uh, results from the model which have, um, which have uh, conf uh, controlled for the confounders the most. And that's it from my end, thank you. Thank you, Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sabina and Lovely. That was really fascinating. Um, to save on time, I'm going to turn it right over to Martin, who's going to talk about why this evidence and gap map was uh, commissioned and how it's going to be used. And then we're going to head into a Q&A. Martin, over to you. Thank you very much, Alison. And yeah, it's a real privilege to be able to present this um, rationale for funding this evidence review and be, I'd like to thank um, Sabina for the presentation of the EGM and also Lovely for updating on some of the challenges associated with the, um, with the evidence, with the evidence um, reviews, systematic review. Um, so I'm just going to share with you a couple of slides just to explain why the Independent Evaluation Union of the Green Climate Fund has, has co-funded on um, this, this evidence review alongside the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Um, so the independent evaluation unit has a mandate uh, for discharging both an accountability function where we hold the secretariat accountable to the board and also supporting a learning function, not just within the independent evaluation unit itself, but also across the, the Green Climate Fund as a whole. 
and the evidence reviews that we finance and co-finance uh, inform our independent evaluations that we're, that we're conducting. So for example, within the last 18 months or so, we've completed independent evaluations on the adaptation portfolio and approach of the Green Climate Fund um, the funding window based on requests for proposals, um, the approach of the Green Climate Fund to the private sector, and also the relevance and effectiveness of GCF investments in the least developed countries. So evidence reviews summarize the evidence base on a particular topic relevant to an evaluation before its completion. Um, so currently we've, we've financed a range of different evidence reviews and these are fed into our adaptation evaluation. Um, we did an evidence review on results-based payments and this fed into the same evaluation, the adaptation evaluation. We completed an evidence review last year on private sector investments in mitigation and is fed into our private sector evaluation and three evaluations that are concluding now um, on behavioral science, on women's empowerment and on transformation, transformational change are feeding into the second performance review um, of the Green Climate Fund. So that's the rationale for why we finance evidence reviews as a whole and I'll just quickly run through the background for financing this particular um, evidence review on, on women's empowerment. Um, so the GCF adopted a gender policy and action plan and this was revised in the gender equality policy. So this moved beyond the narrow understanding of gender to consider the contribution of, of both women and men and to consider respect and value that. And the GCF's approach to mainstreaming gender and requires quite a strong understanding of gender issues and gender capacities by accredited entities. And this isn't always immediately available in the agencies that, that are accredited by the Green Climate Fund. The gender policy sets out a commitment to measure outcome areas and impacts of activities on both women and men's resilience to climate change. And some of the indicators um, for that could be, could be better fleshed out um, within, um, within the fund. The gender policy also offers additional resources and support for countries and entities and when, they're, when they're meeting the standards set by the fund's gender policy. So I'll just quickly run through the steps that accredited entities, these, these are the agencies that implement, or these are the agencies that are funded by the GCF. Um, and I'm just going to outline the steps that they need to run through um, to, uh, to, to comply with under the gender policy. Um, so before an accredited entity has a, a proposal that's, that's funded by the GCF, um, the fund will provide, does provide some gender training modules within its readiness and preparatory support program. So the Green Climate Fund is held for and, and provides the largest readiness finance of any, any, any climate fund. And so this is preemptive enhancing capacity support for accredited entities before they complete funding proposals. When accredited entities deliver a funding proposal, um, they need to comply with gender policy standards. And what we found is that many direct access entities, these are national entities um, who are funded by the GCF, they don't necessarily have in-house gender capacity. Often that capacity will lie in, an, in, in a ministry or would lie in a uh, another organization. It's not necessarily the case that they have um, in-house um, capacity to, to meet um, GCS gender policy. When the accredited entity is funded by the GCF, it needs to submit a gender assessment and gender action plan. And this requires some investment by the accredited entity. And what we found is that the gender action plans vary considerably between the international accredited entities like UNDP and Food and Agricultural Organization and the direct access entities um, who are, are nationally owned and, and nationally based or regionally based um, entities. Um, so the, the quality of these gender action plans varies. Um, the Secretariat then reviews the gender assessment and gender action plans and whilst all projects comply with this, we've, we've found that the the proposals from accredited entities can be can be delayed um, due to due to refinement of the gender assessment and gender action plans. The GCF Secretariat ensures that um, activities and implementations are informed by gender assessments, and it does this through verification and project reviews. 
and then through the reporting procedures within the GCF, accredited entities detail their progress on the gender action plans. And the fund can organize additional gender training or provide technical and material support for ent uh, accredited entities um, on, on an ad hoc basis. And this is either by the GCF directly or through gender consultants and uh, experts. So that's the, those are the steps that entities funded by the GCF have to have to go through to adhere to the, to the gender policy. And the evaluation, the independent evaluation units found that whilst the policies apply to all projects and most projects um, include dimensions for supporting women's livelihoods directly, but the quality and depth of the gender assessments, they vary between projects, especially in regards to the ability of the project to deliver sort of transformative benefits to women and girls. So on the shallow end, projects tend to disaggregate the number of women and men that participate in activities and uh, uh, benefit from adopt, adopt interventions and benefit from, from GCF activities. Um, and on the, on the deeper end, um, we found that you know, a number of projects do indicate how women's lives and livelihoods and roles can be transformed um, through, through GCF investments. And so that's the, the rationale for funding the evidence review is to, is to enhance and increase the number of GCF projects um, that, that, that support um, how women's lives, livelihoods and roles can be transformed through the interventions. And, and this is really because there are critical sectors that are responsible for emissions, such as agriculture, energy production, consumption, forestry, buildings, transport. These, these directly involve um, women and girls um, on, on, on many levels. So any effective strategy for mitigation and in addition, adaptation um, needs to ensure that sort of gender equality through women's empowerment is really at the heart of, of the project. And that is the rationale for financing this particular evidence review. And on that note, I'll stop sharing my slides, Alison, and I'll hand back to you for the Q&A. That's wonderful. Thank you, Martin. And again, thank you, Sabina and Lovely. Really great presentations and introduction to what is quite a complex topic. You did not take <laughs> undertake something very simple. Um, which is uh, what your evidence gap map has demonstrated, the fact that you had to uh, look at a variety of different interventions and outcomes that we don't have standardization across how we're measuring empowerment or even uh, implementing empowerment based approaches um, uh, makes, it, makes it quite a challenge to try to summarize. Um, I'm curious, I, I've asked, it, First of all, let me see uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat and I can read them out loud. Raise your hand or just speak up. Um, and while people are getting organized for that, maybe I'll start uh, with a question for you, Sabina, and lovely for the team who did the evidence and gap map. Um, you said that when you were doing the search, you looked at outcomes to identify the studies. So to look for those empowerment related outcomes. Can you comment on some of the challenges of doing a study or a search based on looking for that or even if there are any benefits? Because um, I can imagine sometimes outcomes aren't always necessarily reported up front, particularly at the abstract stage. So, so what, what uh, challenges did you find and how did you overcome that? for the question. Yes, it was actually a challenge because uh, sometimes like uh, we were very sure that there will be some studies like with empowerment becoming a buzzword, probably every study would, you know, put empowerment as a, uh, if, if it is there in the keyword, it gets fetched, you know. So we were uh, sort of, uh, we wanted to make sure that it is actually as per our framework, like, you know, so of course it cannot be, uh, uh, you know, ruled out at the title and abstract stage at times. But then we had, uh, you know, the, the screeners or uh, the people who were screening those, you know, studies, they were told to check through the full texts uh, when we were at that stage to make sure that those studies are included. 
so that is there and uh, similarly we have another review that we are doing which is for gender transformative interventions so it is again uh, i mean it's very tricky because uh, some interventions can actually be gender transformative but they might not state themselves and the vice versa they, they might not actually be gender transformative so the concept has to be clear to the teams like what we are actually what is the like the inclusion exclusion criteria should be very clear to the teams and then you know uh, that is uh, and uh, and that's exercises that we did initially with the uh, if ifad and the gcf teams they were pretty helpful uh, and this having this framework was in fact a lot of uh, you know it 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 was like half the you know we we almost uh, got uh, the half uh, how is it called I, i can't really put it in words like we were pretty sorted with this thing and then it was less challenging despite i mean i won't say i won't rule out the possibility that it wasn't still challenging but yeah it was less challenging after we had this framework sorted thanks that's great any questions from the participants All right, well, let me give you a question, Lovely, talking about meta-analysis. Um, so meta-analyzing the outcomes based on classifying outcomes into these different categories, do you have any uh, views in terms of the pros and cons of that approach? Um, I think uh, one of the cons, at least, is that sometimes the outcomes are not similar across studies. So sometimes they're like, very much different across the DC, for example, as the indices that, uh, in, for example, the indices that I've mentioned, they're very much, um, very much sometimes different across the study. So it might be tough to compare them, but we try to like, um, we try to make it um, um, consistent across uh, how we categorize these outcomes. Yeah, okay. Um, I was curious about um, when you were when you you broke down the data in terms of uh, different countries, age groups, urban versus rural, etc. Did you happen to break it down by the different sectors that these interventions are being uh, undertaken? For example, are any in the environment sector? You know, given the uh, GCF focus, health. I know one category was economic empowerment, particularly, but agriculture. Um, I'm just curious if you have that information. Is there one sector that seems to be doing more than others? Oh, yeah, actually, we didn't have that filter for the sectors for, let's say, agriculture, education, or environment like that. But we had uh, one filter called uh, whether the intervention ha or the study had a climate change element, you know, because as you said, so we had that filter, but we didn't find many studies uh, around that. Yeah, so that was there, but we didn't really have those sectors, you know, we, we didn't have that filter uh, for this. Thing. And do you have any insights into, I noticed you had the age group, so you had young women 15 to 24, and then adult women over 24, and then girls, which I'm assuming is, am I right that it would be about from five years old and up? And I'm just wondering if you guys had any insights into um, what sort of data or information is available, evidence related to uh, adolescents specifically, and even younger adolescents? Did you find there was part, a lot of information there, or was there a gap? Uh, actually, uh, I mean, as an afterthought, I thought maybe uh, we could have done, you know, maybe 10 to 19 kind of age group, but uh, I think we can do that for the systematic review. But uh, we had, I mean, we had any anyone below 15 was, you know, yeah, uh, was classified differently. And then we had young women and women above 25, uh, 24 and above. So that was there. But uh, yeah, we didn't have, you know, the very crystal clear, uh, I mean, for apart from uh, those two categories, anyone below 15 was just uh, clubbed together. Okay. Um any questions from the those who are on the line or participants? I guess it means you guys presented everything perfectly clear. <laughs> um, let, before we wrap up, let me ask you guys one more question. You know, based on the results of the evidence and gap map and and your experience um, uh, putting together the framework. Um, that you use to do it, what sort of lessons do you have 
or advice you would have for others who are planning to do a systematic review related to women's empowerment? Um, uh, what, what sort of advice would you give them in terms of not just content, because you, for example, you've given um, a great, uh, you've been able to identify that life skills is a gap and you're going to go uh, down that road uh, um, in terms of a full systematic review, which is great, it's going to fill an important gap, but maybe also in terms of process of conducting a systematic review when it comes to the subject of women's empowerment, what advice would you give for others on the line? Uh, I think what uh, it's a little difficult because uh, I think it depends on the objective of the people. But of course, you can cast. I mean, people can customize as per their you know research question. What are they really interested in? Uh, but what our major takeaway was that uh, economic interventions were you know everywhere because that is an area that is like uh, rather over-researched, if I can say that. But then there are certain areas which need to be explored more. And these kind of evidence and gap maps, they you know put that point uh, for people who are going to do primary research also, or people who are, you know, be, uh, who are going to take up any systematic reviews that uh, this is the time I'm uh, not to sort of, you know, undermine the value of economic interventions, but still, I mean, there are certain areas that can be taken up. But, um, and in terms of process, as you asked, I think it's, it starts with the literature itself, like, and conversation with the specialist that you take their advice. Like uh, we had uh, our, uh, in our, uh, uh, this advisory group members and also as a team member, Professor Nala Kabi was there. And uh, I, <laughs> I mean, she doesn't need any introduction. So she was yeah. there. And in addition to that, we had several other experts and, you know, uh, the team members from IFAD and, GCF who positively contributed to the process. Like uh, we came up with these things, we uh, undo some of the things, moved, shifted categories here and there, uh, you know. So yeah. uh, so that kind of, it's a very iterative kind of process. Like you start with, I mean, it, it doesn't really changes from where you started, but yeah, there are uh, uh, quite many changes in the process. and. And then you have to settle somewhere. Sometimes you feel that it is still not perfect, but then you have to settle there. But I think we did a good job in terms of, you know, we uh, spent quite a lot of time figuring out that framework. And I think that made the process a little easier. Uh, so. Yes, and I, I think many others can benefit from that framework. I think that'll be quite a contribution. So, so thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, and to our participants for joining today. Before we sign off, we do want to remind you that Campbell will be having another webinar on July 26th, and we hope you can join then. It's going to be on improving micro, small, and medium enterprises access to finance. And again, it's an evidence and gap map and systematic review. We hope you can join us. Thank you, Sabrina, Martin, and Lovely. Uh, thank you to Campbell for hosting, and we hope to see you at our next session. Have a good day, everyone.